Thank you very, very much. Um, Catherine stole my joke. Uh, I was going to steal Catherine's joke, but uh, she told it much better than I would. Um, thank you, Ryan, for convening us for your tireless work, uh, you and your colleagues, Julie, others, uh, Senator Gignac, uh, Presque, you know, all of this room, really, uh, your tireless work on such a crucial issue. Um, what I'm going to do in the time I have is to address uh, three points. Um, first, how building a sustainable economy can revitalize, or a sustainable economy can revitalize economic growth while helping to secure uh, the future for our kids and grandkids, uh, something that, as Catherine Hayhoe just said, if we're human beings, we should care about. Um, secondly, uh, a clear point, the time for study is over, the time for consultations is over. It's time to lay the foundations of a sustainable financial system here in Canada, the world's moving forward. And uh, that gets to the third point, uh, Canadians. Canadians deserve results. Uh, and this is a foundation for those results, but also how we go about getting those results uh, matters. Um, so, addressing climate change, this room knows, we know, people feel, it's a moral imperative, it's the moral imperative of our age, but it's also the greatest economic opportunity of our time. And so just as we meet this uh, existential challenge, uh, we should also seize this huge opportunity. So before I talk about sustainable finance, um, let's, let me give a bit of an honest assessment of where we are. Um, we are living through, and we all feel this in various ways, we're living through an age of insecurity, a hinge moment of history that's sprung by a series of crises, crises in finance. When I first started as governor of the Bank of Canada, we had the financial crisis. Uh, crisis in Europe, crisis in, in health, crisis in energy, uh, crisis in geopolitics. And the stakes of these various crises are enormous. Uh, this is a chart of global GDP. You see the difference between the dotted line, which was the path we were on, it wasn't a fully sustainable path, but the path we were on, and the path that we get knocked to with each of those crises. Uh, the slope flattens, the difference between the two paths measured at least on a run rate in about $40 trillion, and a cumulative rate over $300 trillion of lost global GDP. If you wonder why governments and households and people are under pressure, that is a big part of the answer, those crises. In Canada, our per capita real GDP is still not yet returned to its pre-pandemic levels. But of course, people don't look at those figures and do that analysis, why should they? Um, they know this is the case. Uh, the issues are more immediate, they're more visceral. Les Canadiens s'inquiètent de leur salaire. Ils travaillent toujours plus fort, toujours plus longtemps. Mais l'inflation fait en sorte qu'ils perdent no et non gagnent du terrain. Les gens sont préoccupés par le coût de logement, que ce soit à cause de l'augmentation fulgurante des loyers ou de la forte hausse des prix hypothécaires. Et si vous êtes jeune, si vous n'avez pas de logement, la promesse d'en trouver un semble s'éloigner jeu après jeu. Et les gens s'inquiètent de leurs enfants et de leurs avenirs. We're all anxious. We're worried about, Canadians are worried about their wages, because after inflation, they're falling behind, not getting ahead. They're worried about their kids and their futures, their homes. It's a fast-changing and dangerous world. On doit trouver une façon d'aider les gens à regagner conf confiance en l'avenir. Il faut d'abord regarder les faits en face et tenir compte de réalité. Il faut avoir un plan pour remédier nos défis, il faut obtenir des résultats concrets qui donneront aux gens une raison de croire que le progrès est non seulement un objectif ambitieux, mais surtout atteignable, réaliste. En effet, bâtir l'avenir doit être la mission qui doit être au cœur de nos efforts. So it's time to build. It's time to build sustainability, but with that prosperity and opportunity for all. And our greatest opportunity, as I said a moment ago, is to build a sustainable economy. 
I just want to take a quick survey of what's happening around the world. It was alluded to in the previous conversation of the two Catherines. Um, around the world, entrepreneurs, innovators, and businesses are increasingly focused on the enormous value that can be created by solving this existential problem. Investment in clean energy is exploding, bringing the energy transition to an inflection point. And if you just look, it's, if you're at the back of the room, the horizontal line is the average investment in conventional energy. Uh, the other two bars uh, stacked up are the investment in clean energy supply and demand, now running at 1.8 times uh, the level, having grown at 50% over the course of the last year. In recent years, global investments in solar, e electric vehicles, heat pumps, battery storage have all gone parabolic. And investment in manufacturing capacity is surging as new sustainable supply chains, a sub-theme of this speech, new sustainable supply chains are being formed. And, turning to finance, as decarbonization becomes a fundamental driver of company competitiveness, if you have the information, valuation premiums across sectors for outperformers are rising sharply. And those companies who move from laggards to leaders, and that's on the left side of this chart, uh, in terms of uh, carbon performance, are generating excess returns for their stakeholders. At the same time, at the same time of all this value being created, stranded as asset risks are rising. A decade ago, I was amongst those who warned that more than 50% of the world's proven reserves of oil and gas and over 90% of the proven reserves of coal must remain in the ground if the world is to limit temperature increases to one and a half degrees. Then, that was a straightforward statement of climate physics. Now, the world's headed in that direction. The IEA expects that demand for fossil fuels, including oil and gas, will peak over the course of this decade. If you look at the difference between the top line, the green line, and the gray line in that chart, that's the difference in their forecast over the course of the past five year, years for uh, demand for natural gas. It's clear that carbon is becoming a driver of country competitiveness as well. It's a driver of job growth and in the future, it will be the case that great powers will be green powers. And I think this room would agree that Canada can and should be a great power. Building a sustainable economy will bring a multi-decade investment boom after a decades-long drought. In Canada, estimates suggest more than $50 billion of additional investment year in, year out, for decades, if we have a sustainable financial system. And addressing climate change will increase productivity in several ways, including across those value chains and through innovations to reduce energy intensity. In all respects, Canada can lead. We can be the linchpin in the new sustainable value chains that are being created in virtually every industry. We can cement as well our leadership in new industries such as AI, where one of the prerequisites is access to large-scale computing resources and cloud that run on clean energy. And I can tell you from personal experience dealing with the CEOs of these major companies that that is a prerequisite. You need clean power to power the information revolution. We can be the go-to and nature-positive supplier of critical metals and minerals that a sustainable world needs. And given our track record of innovation, we can become the clean energy superpower, providing solutions ranging from hydrogen to nuclear. But in order to lead, we need a sustainable financial system to move ahead. And the Industrial Revolution was made possible by a revolution in finance. You suggested kindly that people had read my book. That will be old news then uh, to them if they have. Um, I'm happy afterwards to give a short summary to anyone who's interested what happened then. The point is, though, that because the sustainable revolution touches all aspects of our economy, we need changes at least as bold 
uh, and is far-reaching in the financial system, and I'm going to spend the balance of my time going through those. The foundation is clear, comparable, and decision-useful climate disclosure. And to that end, eight years ago, when Catherine was uh, starting at, uh, at her political career at COP21 uh, 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 at Paris, Mike Bloomberg and I launched the TCFD, um, then delivered the final um, uh, standards for the Hamburg uh, summit in 2017. Over the ensuing years, uh, they were adopted by thousands of organizations. And we took the voluntary approach as far as it could go. So two years ago this month in Glasgow, we launched the uh, ISSB, and Charles Antoine is here, it was uh, central to it. Uh, we launched the ISSB to de deliver a global baseline of standards built on the TCFD. Those standards, as this room will know, have been finalized. They were finalized in June. They're backed now by the Global Securities Re Regulators, IOSCO, backed by the FSB, and numerous jurisdictions, by the way, that's the history of the TCFD, numerous jurisdictions are now implementing them, not discussing them, implementing them, such that they could cover over 100,000 companies by the end of next year, worldwide. So the world's moving from concept to reality on disclosure, and where do we stand? Well, we've been working on this issue for years. In 2019, the expert panel on sustainable finance released their first report, including a call for mandatory disclosure. There's over 150 Canadian supporters, including many of our largest companies, that report on the TCFD. Large Canadian government organizations with more than a billion in assets are required to make these disclosures, and all Crown corporations will have to report according to TCFD by 2024 and OSFI uh, is implementing with respect to federal financial institutions. But our securities regulators have been moving more cautiously. Two years ago, the CSA published a inst national instrument for comment on a comply or explain basis, and they also consulted on an alternative which would disclose only scope one emissions, a limitation that would, in my judgment, leave Canadian capital providers and, by extension, our economies, our workers, at a material disadvantage. One of the benefits of Scope 3 emissions is that it aligns the interests of buyers and suppliers in reducing carbon footprints, which would help secure our point, our position in those global value chains that are being created. The CSA is reviewing the ISSB standards. Their eventual conclusions should be coordinated with the CSSB possibly as late as 2026 for disclosure in 2027, despite SFAC recommending back in February mandatory disclosure in aligning with the SSB. My point is it's getting beyond time for us to implement mandatory uh, climate disclosure. The need's been long recognized, the world's moving forward, and we could end up in a situation where Canadian firms are subject to a patchwork of, uh, of methods including extraterritoriality from the EU and California, and many of them uh, simply are companies simply not disclosing. This will slow investment, job creation, and hold back competitiveness. Let me go quickly to the second building block, and Catherine uh, McKenna mentioned this in her comments. Second building block is sustainable finance, which is you need a plan, you need a transition plan to go out and be part of the solution. The guidance for those plans has been provided by GFANS. Uh, we released it for COP27 last year. We're consulting on updated guidance now, including a complement to those, which is expected emission reduction, which will help show the true impact of transition finance and will help get capital to the hard to emit sectors, which uh, are numerous in our economy. There is voluntary action and real momentum here. There's more than 200 global financial institutions that are publishing transition plans now. But just like with the TCFD, there's limits to voluntary action. There's always gaps, there's always laggards, um, and they also don't fully weight public policy in interests, uh, particularly the just transition. So we need a statutory and mandatory approach. Outside Canada, that momentum is happening. It's happening much quicker than it is in, uh, did in disclosure because we have much less time. So the UK's Transition Plan Task Force 
published last month its final disclosure uh, framework, which will be mandatory. The Treasury, uh, the U.S. Treasury has uh, just announced their principles based on the GFANS framework and a growing number of jurisdictions you'll see on the screen, including major standard setters, uh, are endorsing this. Uh, and I would draw attention to the Financial Stability Board work to coordinate consistency across jurisdictions. And the question for Canada is what role are we going to play in this coordination when we don't have an agreed approach? SFAC um, has uh, released their roadmap. It was September of uh, 22, and I, I congratulate you, Kathy, and the, uh, the whole membership for that. Uh, it outlined 10 recommendations for a Canadian green and transition finance taxonomy. Uh, as yet, those uh, recommendations have not been answered. My point, the world's moving forward on transition. Canada has a good, I'd suggest a great roadmap. We need someone to drive the car. The financial plumbing I've just outlined is vital to build a sustainable economy. And they help take the economic agenda and make it everyone's. We can build not as a government, we need to build as a people, as Canadians. And that means strong, sustainable and balanced growth is uh, tout partout et tout à la fois. Now, I'm going to finish, um, I am going to finish. Um, Catherine got an extra minute. Um, I'm going to finish by uh, just underscoring a couple of things. We recognize that the scale of what needs to be done is enormous. It touches all aspects of our economy. There are huge capital requirements. This cannot come from government. We need governments to set credible and consistent policies. They need to be ambitious. They need to be applied fairly. And then with the foundation of sustainable finance, the point of all your work, the point of today's discussion, that capital can move to the Canadian businesses, the entrepreneurs, the unions, the workers, the people to deliver the future that our children and grandchildren deserve and the economy and the economic growth that we need today. Thank you very much. All righty. Uh, so I'm really excited because I'm with my favorite Catherine, uh, Catherine Hayhoe. Hello, Catherine. Likewise. I'm assuming everyone knows Catherine Hayhoe. She's like the world leading scientist talking about climate, um, but she's also a plain talker. So I think she has that as a huge advantage because we got to talk like real people talk, and Catherine talks like real people talk. And she also inspires folks, but she tells hard truths, which I'm all for. Um, okay. Uh, okay, so Catherine, let's start at the beginning, because um, sometimes you in politics, you're like, let's start at the politics. Actually, no, let's start at the science, because um, that's what climate change is ultimately about. It's, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a science problem. So where are we at on the science right now, going into uh, COP28? So I apologize for that very long title. And the most important thing probably that you should know about me is that I am from Canada. So I keep a very close eye, not only on what's happening internationally and in the States, but also what's happening right here. And what we see is that the chickens are coming home to roost. We have been conducting an unprecedented experiment with our planet over the last couple of hundred years, especially over the last 50 years. I mean, during my lifetime and most of our lifetimes, the majority of our carbon emissions have been produced. And they're building up in the atmosphere, wrapping an extra blanket around the planet, causing it to warm. So what are we seeing happening here today? We are seeing our heavy rain and flood events are much more frequent. Sea level is rising along both of our, or I should say all of our coastlines. Extreme heat is becoming more frequent, invasive species are moving across the border, and this year we saw record amounts of area burned by wildfire. Our forests already flipped from a net sink of carbon to a net source of carbon 20 years ago, but today, this year so far, and we're not done this year, the carbon emissions from our forests alone are equivalent to more than half of the world's lowest emitting countries. 
So the science is very clear. The impacts are here today, and we have to prepare. All right, so we got a problem. Um, so I'm sometimes at events, and, and not this event, because everyone here is super motivating. And uh, thank you, Ryan, for bringing together uh, such an awesome audience. And I see so many friends and so many people who are really kicking it on climate. But some people are like, well, I don't know, 1.5, yeah, we can't do that. We can't, it's like really hard. Let's just adapt. I mean, I know I'm doing this with an audience who obviously is a little, you know, probably smarter than that. But I, I think the question really is, and including going into this COP, like, okay, so what do we do? Not do we really give up, because I don't think anyone's going to admit that we should give up. But, you know, there are people who are like, well, I don't know, like, you know, we can't do this. Costs, um, not looking at the cost to people and, and the economy, but like, you know, they're, they're just, they're saying, well, it's too hard. What's your, what's your take on that? And what do we need to be saying in response to folks when they say that? Well, it is hard because we are talking about a change that is faster than any that we've ever made before. And we have to do it deliberately. But here's the good news. Not only are we reaching a tipping point in terms of experiencing the impacts of climate change here and now, we're also reaching a tipping point in public opinion. The vast majority of people in Canada in the states, even in Texas, where I live, the majority of people are actually already worried about this problem. In fact, there was a new study in Texas showing that 40% of Republican voters in Texas are worried about climate change. Um, and that means that definitely the majority are. So people understand that we have to do something about this. And there's no big red easy button. There's no silver bullet. There's no one piece of technology that will fix the whole thing. But the way I think about it is by using the analogy of a swimming pool. So imagine the swimming pool is the atmosphere. The level of water in the swimming pool is the level of heat trapping gases. Before the Industrial Revolution, our toes could just touch the ground. But we stuck a giant hose in the swimming pool and we've been turning it up every year. So what's the first thing we have to do? We have to turn the hose off. What's the second thing we have to do, and this relates directly to your own initiative, we have to make the drain bigger by investing in nature to take carbon out of the atmosphere. But the third thing we have to do is we have to learn how to swim because our toes don't touch the ground anymore. But here's the thing, we can't just do one of those, we have to do as much as possible because the faster we turn off the hose, the less adaptation is required and the bottom line is the less suffering there will be. Well, thanks. I'm a swimmer, so I appreciate the, the, the analogy. Um, okay, so you live in the Alberta of the U.S. Um, and, uh, you know, what, what are you seeing there on the ground? Like, you talked about public opinion, but what are folks doing? Are they just like, we're all in on fossil fuels, we're just going to continue doing this? Or are you seeing a shift? Well, the interesting thing is that um, a big part of the reason I live in Texas is because I think it's the best place to be a climate scientist if you want to be advocating for climate uh, preparedness and climate solutions. Texas has already been number one in wind in the U.S. for well over a decade. This year, they overtook California as number one in solar production in the United States. When you look at the investments from the Inflation Reduction Act, the majority of those investments are going to conservative states like Georgia, um, South Carolina, and some to Texas as well. We see that cities are really leaning in to building resilience and reducing emissions. We see that a lot of companies are and a lot of financial organizations are talking about the financial risks associated with inaction, stranded assets, uh, disrupted supply chains and more. So right here on the ground in Texas, I see so much change happening that I truly am convinced that if it can happen here, it can happen anywhere. And I know that that's a key message that you talk about, too, because um, you were part of the and led the Integrity Matters report for the UN about net zero. And it isn't just Integrity Matters when it comes to countries, right? It's about organizations, businesses, cities. We all need to be part of that. So tell me about that report. Why did you write it and what does it say? 
Uh, well, the focus of this report, we spent a lot of time talking, as you say, about what countries uh, are doing, but ultimately we need everyone working hard. Um, and that includes financial institutions, uh, it includes corporates and cities and regions. And actually, I'm going to point out, this is working, this is building on the work that two people who are at my table did, Mark Carney, who's worked extraordinarily hard to bring financial institutions together uh, around net zero and to do real action to not just reduce emissions, but scale the money, as well as Eric Usher that you'll be hearing um, from as well. Uh, also Canadian, we just have Canadians everywhere around the world, it's really awesome. Um, who's at you at UNEP at five. So they're doing really, really important work because it's, it, as I say, we got to move the money. So what was this report about? It was really, um, so the UN Secretary General said like, look, we need to be clear about what net zero is. It's not a fact free thing that everyone's like, hey, amazing, I'm net zero, give me an award. As I say to my kids, like, I don't know, you're not getting an A for, uh, for showing up at school, you're doing, getting an A for doing the work. And so that's really what it was about. I'm gonna do my, my sustainable finance joke, which I think is maybe funnier, although Mark thinks I bury the, the punchline, but you guys can decide. So, Net zero, how to think about net zero. So my dad, who sadly passed away, was Irish. I was just actually in Dublin. And so it's based on a story of a, an Irishman who goes into a pub. So Mick goes into a pub. And he's so excited to tell his friends. He's got this really big announcement. He says, boys, boys, I've got this announcement to make. Uh, I'm going to give up drinking. And they like almost fall off their chair. They're like, Mick, you're at the pub every night. You're gonna give up drinking? And he says, well, well, you know, I need an orderly transition. So I'm gonna give up drinking at 2050. And so there's like quiet. And everyone's like, 2050? Like you're gonna be 105. And he says, well, you gotta do an orderly transition, you know, can't do this too fast. And then he, he says, and actually, you remember like most Sundays, I gotta go to my ma's for dinner, so I don't always come to the pub. So I'm gonna get credit for that, so actually I'm gonna get five or 10 years in addition. And so then they're like, okay, this is ridiculous. And then he says, and you know what, I've got a beer fridge and we call it carbon capture and storage. Okay, like better laughs, better laughs, okay. Okay, the reason I tell this is because we're kind of living in a fact-free world, and I would say Canada is actually at risk of being a bit fact-free because 95% of GDP is covered by net zero commitments. But to be honest, it's not about 2050. As my kids say, like, you may be dead then. I said that's actually not the plan. But the reality is it's 2030, folks. We gotta reduce global emissions by half by 2030. So when people say, I'm so all in on climate, I'm a climate leader, I'm putting up my hand, you ask them, like, are you actually doing the work now? This isn't a future problem, as we have heard very eloquently. This is a now problem, and you gotta reduce your emissions, and you gotta scale the money, and that has to happen now. That's absolutely right. And as everyone can tell, you are also a very direct and clear person. So if you had to summarize this report, because everybody's like, you know, cut to the chase. What do we have to do? So if you had to summarize the report, what do we have to do? What must be done? And then what must not be done? How would you summarize it? Okay, I think this is really important. So you can go read the report. It's written in plain English and it's only got 10 recommendations. I work in three and tens. So we did 10 and this was an expert group around the world. Um, and it was, it was environmentalists, yes, but it was also regulators, uh, financial regulators. It was also business people. It was scientists. It was a bunch of really smart folks. So basically it can be summarized like this. What must you do? You must have a, yes, a long-term target, but you must have interim targets that are aligned with the science. So that means you need a target like ideally 2025, but certainly 2030, 2035. Uh, you must have a transition plan where you report trans you transparently what is your baseline and where are your emissions, where do they need to go, um, so that you actually have a direction. That's very normal for business. Businesses understand, so you have to have plans. Um, and then you need to uh, report transparently so you can be held accountable. Are you actually doing the work you said? Not in 2050, the work right now. But the, the Secretary General was also worried about greenwashing, so we were also clear about what you can't do. And once again, anytime anyone says net zero, just do this, do this really quickly, this little three things you must do, three things you can't do. You cannot be investing in new fossil fuel infrastructure. 
That is not me. That is not, that is the International Energy Agency. That's just, just a thing. You cannot be building new fossil fuel infrastructure. We have a lot. We have a lot on deck already. Um, two, you, uh, you can't just buy cheap credits rather than reducing your own emissions across your value chain. Um, three, you can't lobby against climate action. You need to lobby for positive climate action. Um, so that's kind of my quick, uh, that's my quick summary. Okay, we have five minutes left, so we're gonna have to do some quick things here. First, myth busting. So we'll do this really fast. Myth busting, there's a lot of people who are like, Canada, we're gonna be a world leader, we're gonna be the last barrel, and we're gonna do LNG right now, new LNG. What do you have to say? If it were 30 years ago, I'd say that sounds like a great plan for the next 10 years, but we're at the point now where if we keep on going, we're going to miss our Paris goals within a very few number of years. There is no question that our emissions need to be heading down. We need to be accelerating the transition to clean energy that we have a lot of potential for right here in Canada. And we need to be doing so with gratitude for what fossil fuels have brought us. They brought us to the place that we're in today, but we have to be looking to the future, not the past. Okay, next one, tech. Is tech going to save the world? And I mean that CCS. Oh no. Okay, wait. She's like, she's like as if. But no. Um, are we going to get her back? Are we going to back? Okay. So we did rehearse this. This is like a little thing. Um, oh, Catherine, you're back. Tech. Tech. You were so mystified by my question that you are you back? Oh shoot. Fixing climate change. Carbon. Ca can you hear me? Yep. Go for it. Okay. Uh, carbon capture and storage, direct air capture, both of those technologies have potential to reduce the last few drops of carbon coming out of that hose or going down that drain. We know we get the biggest bang for our buck, and that is in efficiency, it's in clean energy, it's in working in areas to change the amount of energy that we need, and it's investing in nature. That's how we turn off the hose and make the drain bigger, the furthest, the fastest. And the number one mechanism to do that, that just about every economist in the world agrees on, including the two who won the Nobel Prize for economics a couple of years ago, the number one mechanism is carbon pricing. So let me tackle the elephant in the room, Catherine. Is carbon pricing responsible for the cost of heating oil in Eastern Canada today? Oh, that's funny that you should ask that question. I've been thinking about that. <laughs> No, no, carbon pricing is the most efficient mechanism to reduce emissions, and we've done it in the most affordable way. We spent a lot of time thinking about people. I personally worried about people, so we give all the money back such that the most vulnerable are better, better off. Why are people paying more for heating oil and actually gas? Because heating oil and gas costs more, and because these companies are charging more while they make massive profits that they give to their U.S. shareholders, and then they come here and they demand subsidies. Like, I think we just have to be realistic about what's going on and call things out. It's extremely important that we work on facts. And unfortunately, they're enabled by folks who want to, weirdly, conservative politicians that want to diss the, the policy that is so the most conservative policy. It was used by Brian Mulroney to tackle acid rain, putting a price on pollution. That you had Quebec in a, in a car, uh, cap and trade market with, um, with California. And if you don't believe me, believe Arnold Schwarzenegger, because he's about terminating pollution and growing his economy. There's a video out. Yes. I did it with him. Um, okay, last thing, because I know that we're probably over time, but I think we got to end on a positive note always. We have all these leaders. I don't know if you can see them, but we have amazing leaders in this room. So what can they do? How do we get everyone on board this? So it's not a sinking ship, but it's a ship that sails to the clean economy for a more sustainable future for our kids. We need to be investing in the future not the past. We need to be recognizing that every decision is <laughs> is important, is clean, <laughs> moves the money. <laughs> okay. Well, it was going to come back to me. Uh, we need to drive emissions. You just have to be. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is one of the this problems. It's very jarring. <laughs> it is. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, I think I'll just go for the second one that you can then you can go. Um, I mean, look, we got to move the money, and why? How do we do that? We we need the, the we need the green taxonomy. We need the framework. I actually work a lot abroad, and very large investors are like, "Do we have a green? What's going on in Canada? I heard you had something. I read in the paper that maybe you have something. We have it. So the finance minister, the finance department needs to actually put it out because it's very clear, supported by all financial institutions, about what is considered green. That is extremely important for certainty and to move money. Um, okay, you get the last word though. What is, I think you're still there, good. Okay, what's yes. the last word for these folks, motivating these folks, because they're fighting every single day uh, for a cleaner future, but to move the money and to make Canada a winner in the clean economy? Every decision is a climate decision. And to care about this issue, you don't have to be an environmentalist or a scientist or a former minister of the environment and climate change. You just have to be a human being living on planet Earth because all of us are impacted by this challenge, but all of us have the potential for a better future. And so what we have to do, if you're working with somebody who doesn't seem like they're interested, figure out what makes them tick, what they already care about, and help them see how what they already care about makes them the perfect person to advocate for and support climate action. I truly believe every single one of us has the values that we need to care about this issue. And if we already care and are already motivated, it's our job to help people find what they care about and help them join in the fight too. Woo hoo, Catherine, hey ho. Woo. <laughs> Thank you, okay, we're probably a little late, but not bad, not bad. <laughs>